I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Good to see everyone. Erev Tov. Uh, it's a little bit more Erev in the East Coast uh, than it is for us here in Los Angeles. And welcome to all those um, who are joining us, uh, either through Beth Jacob or around the world. We're so, so glad to have you yet back once again for another stimulating series that will expand our minds and give us a greater appreciation uh, to the Jewish world and Jewish history. We are very, very privileged to be able to introduce uh, Rabbi Dr. Henry Abramson, who has been a wonderful source of information now multiple times, and we've created Baruch Hashem, a really wonderful relationship uh, where so many of our members have shared with us how enlightened they've been from your talk. Um, we will uh, share the recording uh, through the shul afterwards um, and want to just uh, recognize um, this evening that we have participants who have uh, come from all over, including many from our congregation here at Beth Jacob, to be able to learn uh, tonight. So we're very excited for this first installment of our series and uh, look forward to hearing from Dr. Abrams. Thank you very much, Rabbi Pose. I really appreciate it. And it's really tremendous host, tremendous privilege to be able to be speaking to your amazing congregation yet again. Um, I remember that the uh, the exchange, the give and take of ideas last time we spoke and the time before that really was, uh, was exceptional. And um, I'm looking forward to that as well again today. Um, I'm just going to quickly see if I can share my screen appropriately. And let's see. Okay, can everyone see my screen properly? The uh, yes, map between Ashkenaz and Sparad? Yep. <clears throat> okay, excellent. So then uh, let's get started. Uh, I have to apologize because I only know about 10 or 12 jokes, and I tend to repeat them over and over again. And it's hard for me to imagine I haven't told you this joke already, but I'll hope that, you know, the with the lingering effects of long COVID, some of you will have forgotten and we can, you know, tell a joke again. Hope you'll still enjoy it. And I'm also thinking that given your geographic location, it's especially appropriate. The joke goes like this. There is an out of work Jewish actor in LA. You must encounter these people from time to time, right? I assume that happens down in your part of the world. And <clears throat> this uh, out of work Jewish actor, you know, he's, he's, putting in his time waiting tables and waiting for his big break as well. And it's just not coming. So one day he's especially despondent. And he's flipping through the trade papers, looking for some kind of opportunity. And he sees that the Los Angeles Jew, the Los Angeles zoo, sorry, that was a Freudian slip. The Los Angeles zoo is um, looking for a gorilla impersonator. And he thinks about it. He says, well, how can I actually lower myself? to this level i'm a stanislavski actor i'm professionally trained do i really want to do this but he says you know my my life is theater and the show must go on and i really have to do it so he goes and he auditions for the part and he gets it it turns out that the los angeles zoo has recently lost its last primate unfortunately and uh, until they can get another one from africa they need to hire an impersonator to play the role uh, in the gorilla enclosure so he steps into the gorilla suit and he goes out there and he's surprised at how fulfilling the role is, how he really, you know, finds himself in it, finds the character in it, and he gets tremendous response from his performances. The, the parents are delighted to bring their children around. The children squeal with joy when he beats his chest. They throw peanuts at him. Day in and day out, he feels like he's finally achieving his goal in life of being an actor. One day, uh, during a particularly violent um, uh, uh, performance, he's swinging from vine to vine inside the enclosure, and he accidentally swings a little bit too hard. He swings out of his enclosure and into the neighboring lion's den. And he looks up into the face of a ferocious feline. And he realizes, unfortunately, his life is about to end. But he remembers from long ago in his days in Cheder that when a Jew is facing his or her last moments, he should, you know, pronounce the, the great statement of the unification of God's name. So he covers his head, his eyes with his hand, and he says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu Hashem Echad. And uh, just then, of course, the lion says to him, Baruch Shein Kavod Machuso Le'olam Bo'ed. And then the giraffe says, Shah, you'll get us all fired. 
<laughs> it's I'm laughing because I find that joke funny, but I just realized I'm, I can't hear any of you laugh. So I'm just hoping that you're either laughing or tolerating me. But I think this is a really good joke for our purposes because it speaks to the idea of Jewish identity, that as a people, especially in the modern age, since, let's say, the French Enlightenment of the late 18th century, we have found ways to submerge our identities underneath, you know, different kinds of layers of political loyalties and of regional loyalties and sometimes religious loyalties, all the while maintaining some kind of core identification as Jews. And that's going to really speak to the topics that we have for the next uh, this week and then two more weeks following. Why don't we start with a quick overview of what I'd like to cover in these three lectures. Um, here we are. Let's see if this works. Great. Here you go. This, you can see, is an old picture of me from before I grew my beard. Again, I'm looking very carefully at those who have their cameras on to see if you're possibly laughing. I really hope so, because otherwise it's humiliating. But at any rate, um, my background, uh, we've spoken before, so I won't go into great detail, but basically I'm a historian. Um, I've had the good pleasure and privilege to study at some of the world's greatest universities and uh, also spent quite a bit of time learning in yeshiva as well. My current major project is a three-volume survey history of the Jews of uh, from the ancient period to the modern, and it's um, forthcoming from Koran Publishers in Jerusalem. The first volume is currently in copy editing, and the second volume is underway. Hopefully, it'll be available uh, by the end of 2024. So the, the purpose of this class is specifically, as Rabbi Posey and I discussed the various topics, we're going to look specifically at the major sub-ethnic groups uh, in the Jewish people, focusing in particular on the Ashkenazim, the Sephardim, and later we're going to look at how the these two groups really amalgamated with the Edut HaMizrach, the Eastern communities, and formed the major uh, segments of the Jewish community around the world today. Now, of course, there are many, many more sub-ethnicities, but these are the really big groupings. Uh, and we're, we'll hope in the third lecture to really focus on what does it mean to have a sub-ethnic identity uh, within a much more global Jewish identification. But for now, our purpose is today to focus on the Ashkenazim, Next week, God willing, we're going to focus on the Sephardim, and the third lecture will look at what happens, especially after the Great Expulsion of 1492, when so many of the Sephardim find themselves in a lot of Ashkenazic lands. What does that say about identity? Uh, my approach is going to be primarily historical, because that's really my comfort zone, is working in history. But we will be dipping occasionally into uh, related areas, uh, liturgy, literature, sociology, anthropology, and so forth. So that's really what we're hoping to achieve. In terms of the uh, method of delivery of this series, it seems that the most um, effective way is for me to basically lecture straight and uh, I'll stop probably somewhere about the 45 minute mark, and then we'll have about 15 minutes or so to have an open ended discussion of, of what the data seems to suggest and uh, perhaps give me some ideas for what I should write for next week's lecture. Okay, so that is the plan. Let's go on to what exactly is a Jewish sub ethnicity. The first thing we should realize is, as the historian and rabbi Beryl Wine puts it, uh, one should never confuse the Jewish people with Judaism. Now, generally, when he is saying this sort of proverbial statement, he means, you know, uh, don't judge the behavior of individual Jews as exemplary of Judaism as a whole, because from time to time, they may not live up to its lofty standards. But in our purposes, we should understand that the Jewish people are really quite complex. And it's one of the great debates among Jewish activists for the last couple of hundred years really has really been trying to define what precisely is a Jew. Is it, for example, a national identification? Well, how does that work when we live as loyal members of many nations? Is it some kind of ethnic designation? So how does that speak to the fact that 
Jews are uh, associated with many, many different ethnicities, as we discussed in our last series when we looked primarily at Jews of color. Uh, is it a purely religious definition? So how do we include those Jews who very much want to be included without necessarily holding on to the criteria of a faith system? So I think the simplest way to understand the Jewish people is really to understand them as some kind of extended, wacky clan, a kind of a, a tribe. You know, we use the phrase members of the tribe, a kind of a an extended family in which there are disparate elements. There are all kinds of people that come into the family, sometimes by adoption, sometimes by birth, blended families, all kinds of things make up families. And that's really what the Jewish people are all about. We're going to look at, you know, two major wings of that family, of which there are at least, I don't know, three or four dozen uh, easily identified sub-ethnicities. They are the two largest groups. The, the Jews known as the Ashkenazim come from the region in Europe, which is identified with the term Ashkenaz. In a moment, I'm going to take you through the uh, the birth of that particular terminology and what it means. Uh, basically, we're talking about northern Germany and France. That's the core region of Ashkenaz. And then there's the other larger group who derive their identity from a major settlement in the Iberian Peninsula, which is known as Sepharad or Spain. Those are the two big sort of wings of the family, the Hatfields and the McCoys, I guess, in some ways. Um, but what makes them a sub-ethnicity? What makes them different at all? Well, the main thing is, of course, that after living in these disparate regions for centuries upon centuries, they develop all kinds of cultural features, cultural tics, cultural idiosyncrasies that are clearly the result of the influence of the cultures among whom they live. Uh, the examples of this you'd see in language, so hence the the, the vernacular of Ashkenazi Jewry right up until the end of the 19th century was Yiddish, which is, as comedian Billy Crystal puts it, basically a mix of German and phlegm, right? That's a joke. It's hard giving Zoom lectures because you don't know if people are enjoying them or not, but I just keep talking. So the uh, but German is, uh, Yiddish is basically medieval German written in Hebrew characters, with a significant number of Hebrew words, Aramaic words, Slavic words, all of these loan words together um, make up this unique sort of Jewish patois that is still spoken in some parts of New York today, for example, and in Israel. Um, so that's kind of like the, the Ashkenazic dominant language. A similar kind of phenomenon happens in the Iberian Peninsula for Sephardic Jews, although the core language there it's, you know, um, it's grammar, it's syntax, most of its vocabulary is a form of medieval Spanish. Uh, then, however, Sephardic uh, Ladino will also shift as it moves out of the Iberian Peninsula and encounters other languages. We'll talk about that, God willing, more next week. But language is clearly one of the inflections of sub-ethnicity. You'll also see national dress, right, what is considered uh, appropriate fashion for an Ashkenazi or Sephardic Jew will be very different depending on where they live. Uh, a whole host of customs. We'll talk more about them, God willing, next week. But, you know, what foods may con be consumed on Passover? What does the Nusach, the, the version of the liturgy, look like? Um, specific customs associated with everything from birth to death. These are all things that come quite often from you know, various influences that come from the peoples around the Jews or how they interact with them. Uh, and we see this in, in the realm of ritual. And there are many, many more ritual systems than the Sephardic and the Ashkenazic. There's the Provençal, which will be from southern France, uh, the Romani, Romaniote from Greece, the Italian Rite, so many different. And of course, you know, the Ethiopian Rite, very, very different. Um, we're going to focus by, primarily on Ashkenazic and Sephardic, but when we get to the third lecture, we'll look at how they influence each other, particularly after that ominous year of 1492. What I think is especially interesting for our purposes, and we're going to deep, we're going to dive deeply into it today, is the question of do sub-ethnicities develop distinct ethical systems? Do they develop different cultural values, different, different 
Weltanschauungen, meaning like ways of looking upon the world, I would like to tender for our consideration that the Ashkenazim were incredibly scarred by the Crusades, and then that scar was, you know, further tormented by later persecutions, uh, the, the, the blood libel, the Black Death, um, and that shaped Ashkenazi culture in a particular direction, whereas on the other hand, the Sephardim, uh, they did not have any large-scale massacre of the same kind of nature until quite a bit later, but when it came, it was, you know, a massive tectonic upheaval when the Jews were uh, forced to deal with the Inquisition and then the expulsion from Spain, which created a very different kind of cultural orbit uh, for the Jews of Spain. And the, uh, the survival strategies used by the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim to deal with these external threats created, I would like to argue, uh, at least in very broad terms, a different mindset of how to cope with modernity. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on my thesis when we get to that a little later. Um, let's look now a little bit at the history of the development of those sub-ethnicities, primarily through a look at migration patterns from the end of the Great Revolt against Rome up until the beginning of the Crusades. So here you see a map of the Mediterranean basin. And if we start around the year 70, which is again, the, the end of the first Roman Jewish war, disastrous wars for the Jews. Uh, the end of this first war um, destroyed the, uh, the temple, of course, and uh, Jewish sovereignty, although it limped along with a client king, Agrippus the first and second, uh, for a little while longer, it really wasn't serious. Uh, then that's followed by the Quito's Rebellion in 115, and then finally a much more serious rebellion under Bar Kokhba in 135. In each one of those, the Jews lost their battle against the massive Roman Empire and succeedingly lost uh, power in their native land. So having a look at Israel here, this is where you would have a major Jewish population in the year 70. And although, especially in the third century, that population would be diminished significantly, it's not a case where the Jews were completely exiled. There was always a Jewish presence in the land of Israel throughout the Persian, the Byzantine, the Islamic period, right up until the 20th century, although it was usually a very small minority of the population. Around that time, there were two major diaspora communities, very active. There was the diaspora community in Babylonia, which was already six centuries old by the time we get to the Great Revolt. This is the region where the Babylonian Talmud would be completed. And you have a significant population of Jews, especially in the Italian peninsula. Uh, this, is, this predates the Great Revolt by about 100 odd years. Uh, and then it is significantly augmented by a massive displacement of Jews as slave laborers to Italy in the wake of the Great Revolt. So this is where Jews are already existing in fairly significant numbers. I'm going to skip over smaller communities, but there were also communities on the Black Sea littoral in Asia Minor and the African, North African coast and so on. I will just look very briefly though at a couple of Ashkenazi communities, or very, very, very tiny communities that probably did not exhibit continuity to the eventual flourishing of these communities around the year 1000, meaning they may have you know, died out or moved on and there'd be no Jews living there. And then later they would appear a few hundred years later. But we do have interesting evidence. Like for example, here in Austria, we have the Halbturm amulet was discovered. This is a tiny piece of gold foil that is about um, five centimeters by six centimeters. Uh, and on it is inscribed some Greek letters. It was rolled up and it was found on the body of about an 11-year-old child in a mass grave of Roman soldiers, which uh, has led scholars to opine that this may have been a Jewish child wearing some kind of an amulet. Why Jewish? Because the Greek letters sound out the great Jewish prayer, the Shema prayer, Shema Yisrael Hashem Okeinu Hashem 
better known as the punchline warm up in the joke about the gorilla impersonator. But this indicates that there was apparently a Jewish family who were not sufficiently literate that they needed to write the Shema in Greek letters rather than in Hebrew letters. But nevertheless, they had great value for the tradition enough to give their child a very valuable object like this. We have no idea as the circumstances of this child's death and how the body was mixed up in a mass grave of adults, the soldiers, was she taken captive? Why was the amulet still with her? But nevertheless, some small scrap of archeological evidence of Jews there in perhaps the first or second century of the common era, quite far away from most other areas of known settlement. Another example would be in the Northern Rhineland, some really remarkable grave markers that were set up to commemorate Jewish soldiers from the region of Iturea, which would be today, you know, on the border of Lebanon. These were Jewish soldiers serving in the Roman army about a hundred years before the Great Revolt, loyal soldiers of the Roman Empire, and their uh, graves were marked this far north. There were three of them up there. So again, very isolated, individual Jews. We don't know anything about communities, but there definitely are some Jews inhabiting the traditional Ashkenazic lands. What about the bulk of Jewish migration movements from Israel? So the main trend, besides that big infusion of slave laborers into the Italian peninsula, is across the coast of North Africa. This is a movement that takes centuries uh, the Jews are definitely in Spain as early as the first century of the Common Era, perhaps even earlier, but it's a movement that swells after the 8th century when the Muslims enter and the uh, uh, and the, the Jews are treated actually much better in uh, Spain at that time. This is the period leading up to the Golden Age of Spain when there will be a very large population of Jews in the Iberian Peninsula as a whole. So Jews are making their way across the coast of North Africa in particular. Again, smaller groups moving into Asia Minor, into the Greek region, the Balkans, but this is really the most significant one. And Spain rises as the, the great community in Western Europe that rivals the size and power of the Jews in Babylonia. Um, then the Ashkenazic movement is from the 9th century, that is the 800s, primarily from the population based in Italy up to the Rhineland. That's when you get the Ashkenazic center, which is much, much smaller than the Sephardic center for centuries. They will only overtake them in population size uh, by the 16th century. So that's basically how the Jews got to where they were with emphasis on the Ashkenazim and the Spartan. Let us now focus our attention on the Ashkenazim themselves. Um, this is actually material, uh, actually not this slide, the next slide that I think I discussed with you last time because I had just come across one particular article. So please forgive me, there'll be a little bit of review. But how did the Ashkenazi Jews get up there? So the main reason why Jews were attracted to the north is because of the rule of some uh, benevolent kings in the north. Uh, some would say Charlemagne, who affected a, uh, a radical change in the trajectory of the uh, cultural development of northern Europe in particular. Um, this is one of the figures that really had a lot to do with taking uh the medieval period or taking Europe out of what was called the Dark Ages. That term is somewhat old fashioned because there really was a lot going on in the medieval period, but not so much until the ninth century. Uh, this is a statue of him in Aachen, and apparently it is said to contain his skull cap, which makes me think, hmm, is it possible he's wearing a yarmulke? Until I realized that no, he's probably, that's probably actually talking about the actual physical bone of his skull. But nevertheless, it was nice to think about it. Uh, his son in particular, Charles uh, Louis the Pious, who in Hebrew is known as Louis Hasid, which is kind of funny. Louis Hasid was even, Louis the Pious was even more interested in attracting Jewish settlement and uh, extending to them privileges. Uh, not quite as much Charles the Bald, uh, there's a lot of questions about why he was called Charles the Bald, because apparently he had a head of hair, not like this guy here, maybe. But the uh, these are kings that sort of 
favor Jewish settlements. And the way that they did this is primarily through issuing these things called charters. Uh, a charter was essentially a written set of privileges that Jews or other groups, depending on the context, could rely upon as sort of the their rights and responsibilities of living in a particular place. And there could be all kinds of things in the charter. They could have you know, the right to, for example, uh, govern themselves by Talmudic law. They could have the right to build a wall around themselves. You know, the, the notion of the medieval ghetto is not really very accurate. Most of the Jews actually wanted to build walls around themselves, not so much to keep themselves in, but to keep marauders out. And if you think that's hard to believe, you have to go visit Boca Raton. I don't know if they have these things out in California, but in Boca Raton in Florida, you've got these things called gated communities, which are very much like you know medieval walls built around the golf courses that uh, people want to protect there. Uh, one of the most prominent families that's considered one of the, the pioneer builders of the Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi community were the Kalonymus family that moved specifically from Italy into the Rhineland in the ninth century. And we can trace their lineage over several generations of literary records. They found in a particular movement called Kaside Ashkenaz that we will revisit uh, in about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and the kinds of things that they did, which were really quite creative because at this time, Ashkenaz was like very far away and very, uh, you know, it was kind of like the Wild West. There were no Jewish settlements. There were no synagogues, no mikvahot, no Asian restaurants, nothing. And so they had to sort of make things up for themselves. They created these things called takanot, which means essentially decrees or rules or ordinances, which helped them regulate Jewish life very effectively and uh, allowed them to weather a lot of external challenges. Some of those uh, rights included the cherem hayishuv, which means the ban on settlement that the Jewish community could regulate its own population. They could create their own, as it were, immigration policies to ensure that only people who were able to carry their own weight would be able to join the community. They had the right of taxation, all kinds of tremendous self-governing authorities. The most famous of the rabbinical figures who was associated with many of these takanot, it's impossible that he actually wrote all of them, although his authority and fame was so great that it was very customary later for people to ascribe any new takana to Gershom ben Yehuda, known as Meor Hagola, the light of the exile. And that was a way of giving it authority. So we see the Ashkenazim making the tremendous way up there. And this is where you begin to see things like, uh, and this is a big inflection point with Sephardim, the Ashkenazim living in Christian lands put a ban on polygamy roughly in the year 1000 under Rabbeinu Gershom Meir Hagola, the light of the exile. And this is something which Ashkenazim, of course, have maintained for the next millennia. Uh, Sephardim did not in initially have this ban, especially when Spain was dominated by the Muslims, who are, of course, not monogamous, they are polygamous. And uh, this would change later as the uh, peninsula became Christian and the ban of Rabbeinu Gershom was ultimately extended informally at first to Sephardim until we get to the 20th century, where it only really is still, um, you know, less known in, in communities like the Yemenites, uh, who really did not have that much contact with Christianity. So this is basically the way in which the community was founded. It is interesting to note, by the way, that we actually have a few examples, although somewhat bizarre, of actual Ashkenazic Jews from this period today. Uh, one group of Jews, which, uh, you know, really provided a lot of really interesting sources for genetic research are a, the Jews that were buried in a mass grave in the 12th century in Norwich, England. Their graves were discovered during the construction of this major shopping center when uh, bulldozers and earth movers came across this deep well and thrown into the well were a couple dozen bodies, men, women, and children, obviously the result of a, a violent act. Uh, Historians could pinpoint it to a specific event in the 12th century. Uh, and what is fascinating is that uh, these bodies, until it was known for certain that they were Jewish, that, that would involve more, uh, you know, re religious questions about how their bodies were buried. 
um, they do DNA testing on them. They found that they were actually quite closely related to modern Ashkenazi Jews, including having features like red hair and blue eyes, which was not as common in England at the time, but associated with the Jews. This particular uh, computer reconstruction gives us a sense of what they might even have looked like based on what they could do with the bone structure and the DNA. Absolutely fascinating material. Now, this is something that we actually talked about last time we met, uh, the Ashkenazic Founder event, and this is largely a result of another genetic discovery uh, in a uh, cemetery in Erfurt, Germany from the uh, 14th century that uh, gave us also much clearer evidence of how Ashkenazim got there. And basically it goes like this. There was a specific founder event when you have kind of like more or less the Adam and Eve of Ashkenazim, which can be determined genetically. And we can trace back the uh, descendants of Ashkenazi Jews to the ninth century in a way that actually supports the literary uh, results that I quickly went through a few minutes ago. This graph here shows you on the y-axis time and on the x-axis you have like populations. So if we start at the bottom with Jews in ancient Israel, where we work with that map around the year 70, let's say, and then Jews are exiled from Israel, moving their way to Italy. We have at this time lots, until you go to the top, by the way, when you get to modern Ashkenazi Jews, you know, who are known today by their superior fashion sense and so on. The we know from you know historical records that there are lots of people who are not of ethnic Jewish descent who find their way into the Jewish people. Think about that definition of family that I started with. You know, the, the biblical story of Ruth marrying into the Jewish people and then later producing King David as her grandson, uh, Antipater, who later produced Herod. Um, Helena of Adiabene, a very famous woman who converted to Judaism, brought her family. And then you have this a massive number of Jews taken from the land of Israel to Rome as slaves. There, they continue to mix with South Italians and North Italians, genetically quite distinct. You know, through various ways, we can imagine them through conversion, of course, also through some other uh, forms that may not be quite as... Uh, you know, perhaps uh, rabbinically approved, but nevertheless producing offspring. And then a certain number of them make their way up to Northern Europe sometime around the year 800. And in fact, genetic research has indicated that about half of Ashkenazic Jews trace their lineage to four Italian women from the Northern part of the peninsula. I like to think of them as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, although we don't know their names, it just appears that there were four Italian women who, for whatever reason, this founder event and the exigencies of time, they are the mothers of half of all Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, the Erfurt remains, which I just showed you a picture of a minute ago, they're right at this choke point, the bottleneck, and almost all Ashkenazi Jews today come from those parents uh, that we can trace with genetic accuracy to the 14th century. If you look at this, uh, and one more small detail about this, this totally um, you know, dispenses with the kind of crazy theory that Ashkenazi Jews are really from Khazaria, much further east, which I'm looking at my watch and I'm thinking, I don't have time to tell you too much about it, but I will skip through it very quickly. This is simply not supported by the genetic data nor is it supported by the linguistic, historical, you know, literary data at all. If you look at this map, this sort of summarizes this complex genetic history. The number one in the lower right is where the starting point is, right? In the first uh, great expulsion of Jews, moving through the Italian peninsula up to point number two. There are, meanwhile, the green arrows, which show the Jews moving across the coast of, sort of North Africa, but the founder event is primarily made up of Jews who were from the Italian peninsula. Uh, and looking at the DNA of those Jews in Erfurt, Germany, the Middle Eastern component is between 15 and 45%, meaning that yes, 
they do have roots in ancient Israel, but the Italian portion is between 45 and 70 percent. In other words, Ashkenazic Jews are very closely related to Italians more than other people, although they clearly have ancient Israelite origins. And that's basically the, uh, the, the, the genetic history of how Jews got to Ashkenaz. Now, this is something I really want to skip through this very quickly, primarily because it it's fascinating and we could spend hours on it, really. But it is a, kind of a bizarre theory that is especially politically sensitive today. The theory is that, you know, you have this weird conversion in the 8th century of this people called the Khazarians from Eastern Europe to Judaism. Uh, it was popularized even in the medieval period. The Kuzari, a great work by Yehuda Halevi, is not a history book, but uses the story of the conversion to prove a philosophical point. And we have, you know, medieval Jewish travelers who show up there and see documents that come from there, like this document in the Cairo Geniza and so on. Uh, all pointing to this notion of Jews actually living in this region of Khazaria. But there's so many questions about it and lots of reasons why it's not true at all. Professor Shaul Stamford calls it a splendid story. I'm not quite as pessimistic as Professor Stamford is about the veracity of the story of Khazaria, but we certainly don't know exactly why they converted. We don't know certainly how Jewish they were because they disappeared from the scene. And we do not see any significant traces of them in the later Ashkenazic migration to the 16th century. We don't see more than a handful of words that might be Turkic, for example, whereas we do see an overwhelming amount of Yiddish and the DNA evidence doesn't point in that direction at all. We can go on and on. And what happened to them in the end? How come they simply disappeared? Like they, they were around for 500 years and then they're gone without a trace? You know, so we have a lot of questions about that. But the reason why I specifically want to mention is because the Khazarian hypothesis is especially favored by people who want to undermine the historical connection of Jews to the land of Israel. This is actually one of the uh, significant tenets of the movement of Hamas saying that the the Europeans who the European Jews who came to Israel in the 20th century and the 19th century were not really descendants of the region. They were really Khazarians who had adopted Judaism as an identity, as a religion and so on, but they had no natural biological connection to the land, which is patently false, but it nevertheless has a lot of traction. Uh, Shlomo Sand is one of the authors who promotes this. He wants to resign and sees considering himself a Jew, for example. Uh, and we see on and on these anti-Semitic uh, theories that the, the Jews are really Khazarians. Sometimes they're called mud people who are bent on dominating the world and things like that. I don't know if you miss, you know, they, they don't actually have in this book cover the word Jew, but I think you get the idea of who they're talking about here. So there's no evidence to support that Ashkenazi Jews are Khazarian in origin in any significant way at all. Okay, let us get to really the material that I think is so important for our purposes. What is it that makes the Ashkenazim different culturally? What is it that perhaps shaped their identity? What historical events made them who we are? So I gave you some indications of that with the sort of pioneering mentality that the Ashkenazim exhibited, willing to go out to these far reaches and then to organize themselves with the Takanot and things like that. But one of the most significant things involved in uh, Ashkenazic history is what happens to them from without, things that are beyond their control. The Crusades are clearly one of the most dramatic events to occur in Ashkenazi Jewry, and uh, I would say had a lasting impact on them. So what were the Crusades? In the year 1095, Pope Urban II, shown here, was incensed that the Byzantine Christians were not a Byzantine, meaning they're coming from primarily eastern part of the Roman Empire, like uh, Constantinople and places like that. They were not able to access the various Christian holy sites in Jerusalem. And so he audaciously called for a worldwide 
union of Christians to rise up, march to Jerusalem, and seize it from the Muslims who had been controlling it since the 7th century. And the first crusade got underway in early 1096 and made its way down there. And by 1099, they placed Jerusalem under siege and they eventually conquered Jerusalem. They held it for a little while. The Muslims were able to kick them out. They came back again on several crusades over the next few centuries. But it was a dramatic really turning point in European history because it demonstrated the potential power of the church to bring together these disparate, you know, really warlords rather than kings and unite them in a much larger endeavor like, uh, you know, what has become the word crusade, which means following the cross. It has become proverbial in the English language as, you know, some great purpose, some great movement and so on. Now, what does that have to do with Ashkenazi Jewry? primarily because there was a large number of followers of the Crusaders who were not really that disciplined, were not focused on uh, Jerusalem in particular. Uh, they were kind of religiously crazed fanatics, peasants, a uh, vast majority of them illiterate, of course, following people like Peter, Peter the Hermit, shown here, uh, directing them off to find their way to Jerusalem. And without the wealth and support, the logistics of, you know, having uh, food procured for them, they had to like fend for themselves along the way. Some of them said, why should we schlep all the way to Jerusalem to fight non-believers, the Muslims, when we have non-believers right here in Germany, the Jews? And so you have a series of horrific massacres that occur in the year 1096, particularly in the summer months of May, June, and July. Uh, they are still remembered today in the uh, Ashkenazic services. We read the prayer of Harachamim, that is a commemoration of the martyrs of these horrific massacres. The towns of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz, a tribe town, known as Shum, was a, were especially hard hit, but also many other larger towns like Köln and so on. And the Jews were caught completely off guard. They found themselves at the mercy of these crusaders and unable to turn to anyone for their aid. In some cases, they went to the local bishop, and the bishops, in fact, tried to protect them, sometimes a little bit more effectively. Some bishops actually you know, try to impose order, in one case, cutting the hands off of some of these would-be pogromists. Uh, but in most cases, the, the bishops were themselves overrun by these kind of bands of hooligans. And they were bent on either converting the Jews to Christianity or to massacring them. The total number of Jews massacred in the Crusades probably does not top 5,000. Still a very large number when compared to the overall population, but it left such a traumatic impact on the Jewish mind, especially because the Jews, in some ways a little bit like today, felt like they had no one to turn to. No one was protecting them. Obviously, there are a few, you know, thank God the United States of America has demonstrated great support for the state of Israel, but it's not hard to feel alone in this current political environment. Uh, but also because one of the things that happened with some frequency, and it is reported not only by Jewish sources, but also by Christian sources, where the Crusaders themselves, who left some records behind, talk about this phenomenon and are amazed that it came to pass. And that is referring to Jews electing to commit mass suicide rather than submit to baptism. Uh, where, you know, Jews would be barricaded inside a synagogue and they're told to come out and to, uh, and to uh, you know, submit to baptism. But then when the Crusaders finally break down the doors, they find that whole families have slaughtered themselves. You know, parents have slaughtered their children and then themselves rather than submit to baptism. This kind of, you know, very defiant position that completely bans even the possibility of feigning adherence to Christianity. That's what the Ashkenazi Jews largely chose during these crusade massacres. Contrast this, we'll come back to this next week, 
But Sepharad had a very different kind of experience where they were baptized by force without having a choice. And then they were allowed to essentially, you know, go back to regular life. And they found that they could live a dual identity being technically Christian, but still observing Jewish life for quite some time, about 100 years before the Inquisition got underway. So that shaped their mind in a very different way. Uh, among the examples, the ways they were shaped is we begin to see the movement called Hasidei Ashkenaz. The, uh, the term Hasidei means the pious ones. It is a term that's used many times throughout Jewish history. Uh, the followers of King David, for example, were known as his Hasidim. Also, Judah Maccabee had a group called Hasidim. But, and there's no historical connection to the Hasidim that we refer to today, the followers of the Baal Shem Tov in the 18th century. Um, but so it means really the pious ones of Ashkenaz. And this was an unusual movement. Uh, some of the most important figures were people like Yehuda HaChassid from the 12th century, who uh, focused on uh, atonement through asceticism, through self-denial, through fasting, through rolling in the snow naked, things like that, to try and like, you know, obviate one's sins. You know, all kinds of strange rituals like self-flagellation, literal self-flagellation, or having one's coffin dragged through the streets before burial, all as the means of atonement. Definitely part of the zeitgeist of that period. You know, you have the movement called the flagellants who would walk around whipping themselves and non-Jews uh, engaged in public acts of atonement. And you see that same kind of thing happening with the, uh, the, the Hasidi Ashkenaz. I'll just say one kind of clever thing about them, which is sort of funny. Uh, Yehuda Hasid famously left behind a last will. And in that last will, which is quite long, I think it's about 15 odd pages in Hebrew, he tells his children how he wants them to behave. It's, it's an ethical will. It's not, you know, dividing up resources. It is all about, this is, I'm on, on my deathbed, I want to tell you how I think you should live. And one of the things he says to his children is, no man, no descendant, no male descendant should marry a woman with the same name as the groom's father, meaning Ruvain should not marry Chaya if Ruvain's mother's name is Chaya also. Uh, and that, you know, people take very seriously. Same for a woman should not marry a man with the same name as her father. There are ways around it, you know, the, the bride can take a second name to alter her name and things like that. But for some reason, people take this very, very seriously, even though there is no source for this anywhere else in the entire rabbinic corpus, not in the Torah or the Talmud, nowhere, except in this one will of Rabbi Yehuda Hasid. And so a couple hundred years, well, about a millennium later, the great Kotzka Rebbe, a famous Ukrainian Hasidic Rebbe, said, if Rabbi Yehuda Hasid had known how seriously people would take his last will and testament, he would have included the Ten Commandments in it, right? <laughs> it's a joke. I laughed to myself because it's Zoom. But anyway, this you see as a kind of like a, a shaping of the Ashkenazic mind, a turning inwards, a, 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 a sort of a dark and sometimes pessimistic view of, of the universe and of, of man's sinfulness. These kinds of things uh, may have been, I would like to tender, perhaps a reflection of their experience in the Crusades, which would then be validated through the blood libels, the host desecration charges, the Black Death pogroms, and so on, that they felt that the outside world was fundamentally toxic, dangerous. Jews had to turn themselves inward, had to become insular. And these are the kinds of things that sort of tracked Ashkenazi civilization for the next few hundred years. That's the thesis I'd like to offer. Uh, and just one last example of this, that, um, that uh, and then we'll, we'll conclude and we'll open it up for questions. One of the most fascinating things we see during the period of Hasidi Ashkenaz are some beautiful illuminated manuscripts, which we have in, in uh, some number, uh, but they tend to exhibit a strange phenomenon known as zoomorphic representation. Like for example, here's a beautiful machsor from the period, currently in the British Library, that's uh, celebrating the holiday of Shavuos. And uh, you see here on the left, here is Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, uh, wearing the, the hat that Jews were required to wear by the 12th, uh, the, the fourth Lateran Council of 1215. 
and he's got the the Ten Commandments there. And standing next to him is his brother Aaron, the high priest. Uh, he, you can sort of tell he's a high priest because he's wearing a bishop's mitre, right? You can see the influence of Christianity here. And Moses is going to give him the Ten Commandments. And here's all the gathered male Jews. And you can see they're all wearing that same Juden hut. But back here, you have this strange assembly of what must be pious Jewish women. But note that they are all represented with animals' heads, they do not have regular female or human faces like the, the men do. They are represented as animals. Now, they're not ugly. They're sort of cute, you know, the large eyes and things like that. They're appealing. Why are, though, why are they not represented as, as humans? So the, the dominant scholarly opinion is because this is considered a sort of level of tzniut, of, of modesty, of uh, not portraying women's faces, which is something we definitely see even in contemporary Ashkenazic culture today. Um, but it's not meant in this picture, I think, to be derogatory, but it is meant to be perhaps a reflection of modesty. One more example from the famous Bird's Head Haggadah, in which many of the characters, not all, but many of them are re represented by what appear to be bird's heads mysteriously. Um, it might be griffins, perhaps. But you can see this is a matzah factory. The bird's head Haggadah, of course, is dealing with Passover. And all of the drawings deal with the story of Passover, the observance of Passover. So here you can see uh, the two figures on the right are baking the matzah. The one on the right is, is like stamping the holes to allow the heat to escape properly. And the other one is actually removing from the oven. And on the left, it looks like you have like a rabbi or someone who is perhaps inspecting the matzah. I like to think of him as having a big word balloon that says, $50 a pound? Are you crazy? But I'm not sure if that's what it says in the original. But again, note the zoomorphism. Uh, the figure in the middle apparently is female. It looks by the, the head kerchief like that. But the males are also represented with a bird's head. So by way of conclusion, you know, we've talked a lot today about how Jews migrated to different parts of the world. Uh, we opined about how that might affect their sub -anesity. Then we focused on the Ashkenazim and the kind of factors that, that shaped them, especially the turning point of the Crusades, which still is remembered today. And I offered you this thesis that perhaps it had something to do uh, with the, the way that Ashkenazic culture span out or spun out of control compared to what happens elsewhere in the world. We'll have to pick up this discussion next week. But at this point, uh, I think we should open it up for questions. I just want to thank you and thank Rabbi Posey for inviting me back. And thank you all for your attention and endurance. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Abramson. Really such a wonderful, uh, again, it's no longer, it's not a surprise. Uh, not that it was before, but it was uh, something that we were all looking forward to. And uh, you absolutely did not disappoint. A couple of questions have come in uh, to me and... Um, there, it looks like there was one that was just quickly, uh, put on on the chat. Maybe if you can see it, Dr. Ibbinson, maybe you can address the questions on the chat first, and then I'll share with you some that came directly. Sure. So let's see, please tell us how to access this recording. Well, um, uh, that's, uh, that will take, take care of that. Um, so the Romani Jews are related to other Jewish groupings. It'll make more sense when I talk about the Sephardim tomorrow, because uh, the Roman out there is a little bit more complicated in their genesis. Um, and now here, Ms. Sutton is uh, saying camera is off, uh, earbuds on. Um, Sorry, I have to run. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, okay. Well, thank <laughs> you for no, 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 I'm just saying, I'm reading what she said. Did the experience yeah. of intense, such intense trauma create distinct approaches to death and dying? I would think so. I mean, if you look at the Hasidic Ashkenaz, and uh, they have a lot of complex death rituals, uh, and especially burial rituals, which we know a lot about because they left a lot of records. It was very important to them. So we have Hebra Kadisha records, the, the Holy Society, which means the burial society, all kinds of of uh, rituals that are meant to emphasize the idea of the vanity of life, the emptiness of life, how fleeting it is. You know, like placing broken pottery, for example, on the eyes of a person before he or she is buried, meant to show how we are like, you know, Kaylin Nishbar and broken vessels. And uh, I, I think that kind of like darkness is definitely a reflection of some of the experiences 
that Ashkenazic Jews had in particular. The Sephardim also had plenty of persecution too, but it was a very different type of persecution with a different temperature, as we'll see uh, next week. Great. Um, okay, so there's a lot of questions that came in connected to anti-Semitism, perhaps, uh, you know, obviously in, in, in the zeitgeist of today. So one question was, um, again, you, you addressed it, I think, in, in a variety of different ways. Do these different sub-ethnicities sub also have different anti-Semitism experiences, and how does that impact what we see in terms of anti-Semitism today? I don't know if that's... Uh, there's actually a similar question I'll share, which was, um, why do we see some kings like Charlemagne and others seeing Jews one way and others so against them. And perhaps I guess that, that talks about the different types of anti-Semitism that again occurs in, in different eras. Right, definitely. So I, I would certainly, uh, it will be easier to address the first question next week when we, uh, like right now we've got sort of a baseline. We've looked at Ashkenazim and we've looked primarily at the Crusades and I've referred to a couple other nasty things. The Sephardim experienced a very different type of persecution. It was like um, it was a slow burn that suddenly went hot as opposed to like a lightning bolt out of the sky. It would be comparison to something like, let's say, um, you know, in Florida, uh, you have hurricanes and, uh, you know, they're going to come every year and people prepare for them. And even with preparation, sometimes there's a hurricane that's just overwhelming. But nevertheless, people learn to sort of deal with hurricanes. Nobody's leaving Florida because, you know. It has no income tax and things like that, no state tax. Um, but another part of the world, like let's say, I don't know, Kansas has tornadoes with almost no warning. You can have a beautiful, clear sky and all of a sudden, wow, the whole world just erupts. And like, so how do people deal with those two different acts of God type weather events? I would like to tender that it affects the way in which they see the world around them. Uh, and we'll see that more clearly when we talk about the Sephardim next year. In terms of the different kings, well, there are a lot of factors that go into it. I like to think that one of the primary factors is almost always economic, right? I tell my students, this is the Abramson rule of history. If you don't know why it happened, it was probably money. You know, so some kings, uh, especially up until the 13th century, realized that, you know, Jews represent a tremendous economic advantage for them. They can be tax directly, they are literate, they're numerate, they're engaged in cash businesses, as opposed to the majority of society, which are still dealing with barter. So there's lots of reasons why it's profitable to have the Jews in the country. Uh, and that's, I think, probably, you know, three quarters of your given kings are going to behave that way. Um, but there are some kings, for example, who get into debt, sometimes they get into debt to the Jews, and it becomes more expedient to expel them and then clear your debt uh, than to try and keep them and to you know, sustain their presence there. The Jews are expelled from France three times in the 14th century, right? Expelled and then invited back because they're too useful and then expelled again. You know, so that's a major uh, phenomenon. And then the third element, I think, is that there's definitely personality issues involved. There's some kings who really, you know, buy into the idea of the value of creating an ethnically monolithic society. You see that Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain were definitely religious fanatics who wanted to make Spain Judenrein. Uh, Philip II of France was very similar, 12th century. So there's definitely some personality issues involved as well. It's a short answer, but, you know, this is a... Uh, we have time for one more question. Audience. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. So here's a, one that um, one of the things that we see in many different, I guess, a dot or sub ethnicities or things today is difference in tefillah. That often prayer, especially nowadays, you see different shuls. Everyone will have different nuances in prayer. Um, so are there also difference in differences in theology that underlie those differences in prayer, or, or perhaps other minhagim? Um. That's a really tough question. Um, I would like to suggest that core differences in theology you don't find that much. You know, the the Talmud, uh, by the time we're speaking about these Ashkenazic Sephardic breaks, the Talmud has really reigned supreme for uh, almost a thousand years. And so the Talmud basically goes through all of these theological 
uh, discussions and, and, and charts a path that Jews will hew to. It may be a fairly broad path, but on most theological issues, it's pretty clear. Like, for example, one God, right? Really basic. Um, there, you may see in liturgy some kind of funky things like, do does it help to pray to angels or does it make things worse? Right. So we see that even in the Ashkenazic literature, lit liturgy, there are there are some uh, parts of the uh, of the Yom Kippur liturgy where, you know, uh, you'll see in your sitter, it says some don't say this. Right. Uh, even in the, the Shalom Aleichem that we read on Friday night, um, that might not be entirely appropriate for some readers. But those are minor things. But basically, I would argue that the big details of theology, no, we're we're pretty much, you know, we've sort of like dealt with um, groups that challenge those core ideas, like the uh, followers of Shabtai Tzvi or Jacob Frank. Uh, but there are minor details that appeal greatly to the Jewish imagination that somehow stick in the liturgy, even though they may not fit consistently with, um, with uh, you know, really diehard adherence to the, the central thought of Judaism. And that you will see clearly very regional variation as well. Wonderful. We really thank you so much for such an enlightening presentation. Looking forward to the next one. Um, we, uh, as they say, same time, same channel. Uh, thank you for staying up late for us. I know it's late, uh, you know, uh, where you're sitting and those who are joining us from Easter here. Uh, but we look forward to seeing everyone next week and we wish everyone a Lila Tov. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Lila Tov. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good. Can I ask you something really fast before I present? Yeah. So he says that 50% of all Ashkenazi have Italian came from four Italian oh, mothers. That doesn't mean they're not Jewish, but they show signs of well, four Italian Jewish mothers. Jewish mothers. Mm -hmm. But aren't I didn't when Lindsay took the DNA thing? Yeah, it said yours goes back to to the Middle East. So does that preclude what he says about for me? Or it could have been from there and then moved up and then moved. Does that does that information about my DNA preclude what he says? Could I could I my descendant, my precursors have been ancestors? Been Italian? Oh, they could have been mixed with Italians, but yours go do go back to the Levant. Yeah. I but bet not all the women, not all Ashkenazis go back to Italy, genetics, it, Italian genetics. That's what he said. A lot. He said something like 45%. It's a lot. I yeah. bet you were from that. Well, yeah, the lighter hair, mm -hmm. the lighter eyes, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't come from my father, it comes from my mother's. Right. Interesting. Now, I don't think we're done knowing it. Right. I think there's still, it's okay. still being a The other thing I want to know is I sort of like dozed a little or lost it a little bit. Tell me when he started to talk about the beginnings of the. Crusades. Why did the Crusades start? What was that? Ten ninety five. Because why? Because he was hearing from the Eastern Roman Church. Who's he? The Pope in Rome. Yeah. He was hearing from the Pope in Constantinople, Eastern Christianity. I'm calling him the Pope. That they were being, they were not being permitted. To visit the, the holy places, but they were being the Muslims were pushing them out. The Eastern Christians. So the Pope in Europe was hearing that the Pope in Constantinople, the Eastern Church, was being pushed out by the Muslims. Okay. 
and they wanted to get back. They wanted access again to the holy places in Israel. Okay, but that didn't have to do with Jews. No, started out to free the Holy Land of the Muslims. Okay. So well, the Christian holy places would Christians have access again. Oh, which they would. What? Get rid of the Muslims. Yeah. Okay, then. But, as Rabbi Wein said, they were all liquored up. On their way to the Holy Land, they encountered people who didn't believe who were Christian. And they went above and beyond their mission. Their mission was to go from France, Germany, all the way down here to Israel and free the Holy Land. Okay. But on the way there, they found other non-believers. Us. Oh. We were the first ones they encountered when they oh. started marching. Oh. And so they, they attacked us. Hey, we don't have to get all, we don't have to go all the way to the Holy Land. Oh. We got infidels right here. Oh. And they attacked. And the word got, the word went from Eastern France. Oh, they're doing terrible things in Eastern France and Alsace. Where Nelly came from. They're doing, and the word quickly went ahead. They were warned, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming to Frankfurt and Mainz and Spire. Okay. They're coming. They're coming for us. They're already attacking the Jews in eastern France. Okay. That's okay. You, you know, now you know. And so those were those terrible experiences, terrible pogrom. Yeah. I love this. I'll be telling Zach tomorrow how good it was. How well wasn't this great? Yeah. Wow. We might this might give us better sound. Can I tell you something? We should test this out here with the TV because the sound sometimes is not that good. Maybe I can Bluetooth it when we're streaming a movie. Oh and sounds, keep it near us. Yeah, it's pretty good. Thank uh -huh.